So let's talk a little bit about prognosis in ALS because everyone has questions around this. And to, to some extent, talking about prognosis in ALS is a very difficult conversation. But I've been told over the years, as I've talked with people who are newly diagnosed, that there are so many fears around this, and they really want to know, but many people have difficulty bringing the topic up. So I'm going to bring it up, and uh, we'll talk about it just a little bit, and I want to answer your questions, because most of the fears around what happens during this process, and, and certainly what happens when someone passes away from ALS, many of the fears are not justified, and the reality is more comforting than the fears. So let's talk about this a little bit. First of all, let's talk about timeline. Everybody wants to know, gee, I have a disease that's going to shorten my life. You know, how much time do I have? And generally speaking, if someone has ALS, they have a steady course. They start out with a certain time frame and they stick to that progressive rate, that progression. So about 5% of people are very, very fast. And we count from the first sign of weakness. And then we count from there. So in 5% of people, it's just a fast, fast disease. They get their first symptom, and they pass away from the disease, from the disease in 6, 9, 12 months. It's just tough on everyone. Fortunately, that's only about 5% of people. 10% of people have a very slow progression. And those people get their first symptom of weakness. They're slow throughout the course of the disease. And they are alive 8, 10, 12 years, or even more after that. Now remember, it's a steady progression. So it's not something where they get very weak, and then they linger in a very weak stage for a long time. 85% of people or so will fall into the average area. And we used to say two to four years. Now we pretty much say three to five years, and I think we're pushing that. I'm going to talk about treatment next, but I think that we're really pushing that envelope and that we're moving towards three to six years as being more of an average than two to four or three to five. So we've talked about the length of life with this disease that people generally have. I will also say that there are those people who have a, an average progression, and then for some reason that we don't understand, they will kind of plateau in a later stage of the disease. And we, don't, uh, we can't predict who that's going to happen to, and uh, it just comes as it is, and then we work with it. So we've, we've talked about the progression of ALS. Many people have questions about, gee, what, a, what does it look like in the final days? And I'll tell you that for nine times, nine, I'll tell you that for nine people out of 10, ALS is a gentle passing. Really, people pass away from exhaustion. Their muscles are just tired out. And in particular, the respiratory muscles are so tired that usually while someone is resting and they've drifted off to sleep, they just can't take one more breath. So for nine times out of 10, what we see is a gentle passing during sleep. That's a predictable passing because you've been working with your ALS physician and your ALS team and you know that you're quite weak. Some people do go into a coma for a few days before. Many people don't. 
but nine times out of ten with the help of hospice in the home, under the good direction of your ALS team, it's a very, very gentle passing. For those people who do have difficulty, so the question always comes up, you said nine, nine times out of ten, what happens to that ten percent of people? Some people will have more difficulty and that's when hospice is really quite helpful with helping to manage things in the home and with medications. So in today's world, for the most part, no one should pass away uncomfortable and that's the whole idea around hospice is really aggressive symptom management. Hospice is not a giving up in any way whatsoever. Hospice is more help in the home and aggressive management of symptoms to make sure that the patient is comfortable both physically and emotionally and that the family has good emotional support. So hospice is a wonderful partner, <laughs> a wonderful partner with the ALS team that you have in clinic. So treatment, yes. ALS can be treated. There are four things that we know from clear, well-documented research studies. Now, I'm a researcher, so I'm, I'm data-driven. Um, and there are four things that we know will increase quality of life and length of life. So those two go hand in hand and are very, very important. The most important thing that a patient can do for themselves is to make sure that they maintain good nutrition. And the biggest principle there is simply don't lose weight. Okay, so don't lose weight. So, number one, good nutrition. We know that it is a prognosticating factor that if you lose significant weight, with ALS that you will not do as well. Even if you gain some of that weight back, if you have lost too much weight, you will have um, hurt yourself medically. Now, what is good nutrition? We don't mean to say that anyone needs to have a special kind of diet, although if you're having trouble getting enough calories in, then you want to have a high-fat, high-calorie diet. But there are many diet fads out there, such as only eating raw food, uh, only eating organic food, only eating this, only eating that. The important thing is to get enough calories in to give fuel to the engine for your muscles. And the best way to tell if you're getting adequate nutri nutrition is weight. So if you are eating a ton of food and you come to me in clinic and you say, Dallas, you know, I'm eating six times a day and I'm eating so much and I'm still losing weight, then I will say your body wants more. It doesn't matter how much you're eating, if you're losing weight, your body wants more and you've got to listen to your body. Another prognostic factor is getting help with breathing at night when that becomes an issue. So good breathing at night. And what happens in ALS is that the diaphragm, which is the most important muscle of breathing, when it becomes weak, you, you, it's, it's more difficult to take a deep breath. And when we're standing up or sitting up, Gravity helps our diaphragm to work a little bit. So under normal circumstances, for all of us, when we're breathing, the diaphragm pushes our abdominal contents down a little bit. Air rushes in because there's negative pressure in our lungs. And when we relax our diaphragm, then we exhale. That's the normal process. So when we're upright, gravity is helping us just a little bit. When we lay down, when we're down, gravity is not a factor. 
So the little bit of help that gravity gives when upright is not there when we're laying down. And so that's one of the influencing factors on why it is that breathing at night can sometimes become a little bit too shallow. So you're breathing too shallow. So people with ALS will have a very specific problem of breathing too shallow at night. That's called nocturnal hypoventilation. And it's very simple to help with that. So the use of non-invasive ventilation or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and it goes by the brand name of BiPAP. If any of you know someone with sleep apnea and they use a little machine with a mask over the nose or the nose and mouth, a tube and a machine about the size of a bread box, this is the exact same kind of thing, only the bi stands for bi-level positive airway pressure. And so when you inhale, there's a little more pressure. When you exhale, there's a little less pressure. So that when you take a normal breath during sleep, you actually get a bonus. You get a little extra. So you're taking a deeper breath during the night. Now, if you do not breathe well at night, if you do not breathe deeply enough at night, your brain will sense that you have too much carbon dioxide in the brain and in your bloodstream. And your brain will say, come on now, take a deeper breath. Take a deeper breath. And if you don't, you will wake from the deep REM sleep that is needed for restfulness and needed by the body. You will wake from that level of sleep and you'll come into a lighter level of sleep. And then perhaps a lighter and then a lighter and then a lighter level of sleep until you take a deeper breath to lower the carbon dioxide in your brain. Some people even go so far as to wake up. And they may, may wake up several times in the night. Well, when they wake up in the night, they think, oh, I must have woken up because I have to go to the bathroom. And then they'll go off to the bathroom, they'll come back, they'll go back to bed. And they won't realize that maybe their body was waking them up because they weren't breathing deeply enough. But if you do not have that deep, restful sleep, you might as well be up watching TV all night or reading a book all night. That is wasted sleep. It is not the restful sleep that you need. And you will have sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation is a very serious thing. It can give people bad dreams or nightmares at night. It can even give you cloudiness of thought during the day, even hallucinations I've seen in a very few people during the day, and can make you extraordinarily tired throughout the day. So it's something to be watchful of and something to Heed the words of your physician, your respiratory therapist, your nurse, when they say it's time to start this very helpful thing that's going to give you a better rest. And what it does, when you have a better rest at night, you have more energy during the day, that equals a better quality of life. And we know through research studies that this will also lengthen life. Okay, so the third thing is really is all which is the generic name for Rilutech. Okay, so Riliazole or Rilutech was put on the market, or was approved by the FDA on December 12th, 1995. And we were so excited when it came onto the market. It was available in your local pharmacy a few weeks after that. And we know this drug works. It's proven in studies. It helps to slow down the progression so that if you start it early, you stay in an earlier stage longer. You stay stronger longer. Now the original study looking at Riliazol showed that for the average person, it gave a three to five month advantage. And that was throughout the course of the disease from the time that you started the drug. Subsequent studies, and there have been five, 
but subsequent studies have shown an even better benefit. One of the interesting things that happened during the Rilyuzol Rilya study was that at the time that study started, there had not been many studies immediately preceding it. And so people had been in line, on lists, to go into this study. And so they were a little bit further along in their disease than, than in some other studies. And so that may have influenced having just a three to five month benefit. But in some of the other studies, there's an 11 to a 24 month benefit, especially if it started very, very early. And so we talk about good nutrition. We talk about good nighttime breathing. And we talk about real yazole. You put them all together, and you get a real benefit. Now, the, there are some potential side effects of real yazole, but they are, for the most part, minor. It has an excellent side effect profile, and very few people do not tolerate the drug. Okay, So let's put all of this together for our fourth point on treatment, and that is a team ALS clinic. We are lucky in this area of California that we have two superb world-class ALS Association certified centers of excellence. University of California at San Francisco and the Forbes Norris Clinic here at California Pacific Medical Center. These team clinics, along with the other certified centers around the country, work together so you have essentially one-stop shopping. From the time of diagnosis throughout the entire course of the disease, you have a team of people that's your team. So at the time of diagnosis, you see the doctor, you get a confirmation of diagnosis. Then you come to the team clinic and you see the physician, the nurse, the social worker, the respiratory therapist, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the dietitian, an equipment specialist, a representative of the ALS Association, and a represent representative of the Muscular Dystrophy Association. You've seen them all. That's right. And it's a long visit. It's a visit that will last three to four hours. But it's one visit instead of going to many different offices so that you have two or three appointments every week and you're always getting in the car and going off someplace. You have this team, and not only, for instance, is the physical therapist an expert in physical therapy, the physical therapist is also an expert in ALS. So there's a tremendous amount of education that goes on during these clinic visits. So there has been evidence, research, that has shown that if you go to a multidisciplinary team clinic for your care, you will have a higher quality of life and you will have a longer life because there is proactive care. We look at nutrition before you lose weight. We look at good nighttime breathing by doing regular breathing tests with you and really searching for symptoms of poor nighttime breathing. We start really is all early. We pull all of this together. So with these four things, we know that people with ALS are in fact being treated. What is the definition of treatment? The definition of treatment is not cure. We don't cure ALS. But you don't cure diabetes, you don't cure heart disease, you don't cure many diseases, but you can change the course of the disease. We know that when you come to clinic, your course of your disease will be altered to the positive for having come to clinic and pulling all of this together. So let me talk about resources right now and, and okay. research that's available. Um, the resources that are available to you are your multidisciplinary team clinics and the, uh, and the ALS Association and the Muscular Dystrophy Association. The ALS Association covers all of Northern California in these areas. Along the coast um, is the northern region, 
the Central Valley North region <coughs> is in here. The Central Coast region is from San Luis Obispo up to um, up to up to Santa Cruz, and then the Central Valley South region here. The Sacramento chapter of the ALS Association covers the remaining part of Northern California. And then there are other chapters throughout Southern California. But each of these regions pictured here is covered by a case manager. So there is a specific person in that area who will liaison, liaise, who will work with the clinic and they'll talk back and forth to make sure that you have all the resources that you need in your community and make best use of, of them. There are support groups throughout Northern California. They're listed here. They're also listed on the website. The first one that's listed is this class. This is a one-time class to go over all of the basics of ALS and then the ongoing support groups in a neighborhood near you. I think that this series of books, Living with ALS Manuals, are extraordinarily important. And not just because I wrote the first chapter in the first book, but they're very important books. They're a little old now. They've been out for, I don't know, eight or ten years. So there are some new things that need to be added to the books, but they are an excellent foundation. A series of six books that you can download on the computer or you can ask for hard copies from your ALS Association representative. I've got some here today. You can take home a set with you if you want. And then the same information available on DVD. Yes. In your new patient packet, if you signed up with the ALS Association, they would have sent you a number of these things. They also have handouts on uh, nutrition, basic home care, and communication. So all of these are very important. I've given each of you a copy of Living a Fuller Life with ALS. This is brand new and I think it's fantastic. And it helps a person new to this disease to understand where the support is, what's going on in research, and gives you a foundation for where's the next step and I think it's been long needed and really quite helpful. The Muscular Dystrophy Association also has a number of wonderful publications. This is the Everyday Life with ALS DVD. They also have it in hard copy. They have a wonderful caregiver manual as well. And you can get those things from the MDA representative at your clinic or from the internet. Now in terms of research. There's a lot going on with research. There's laboratory research, there's clinical research. The clinical research is mostly drug studies. There's a tremendous amount going on with research. Some of the best and the brightest minds in medicine are working specifically on ALS. What causes ALS, we still don't know, but every year incremental steps to find out more and more about that. The more we find about cause, that will lead to better ideas for therapy and then clinical trials, drug studies. So it's, there's a wealth of research that's ongoing. I'm not going to mention all the specific clinical trials right now because uh, they get filled up, people go through that trial, another one starts up. So I don't want to talk about the specifics of them because they change so much. But contact either one of the clinical centers here in San Francisco. Go to their websites and you'll find out much more. So that is the bulk of what I want to say today. <laughs> I want you to know that there is a tremendous amount that's happening in this disease. And I also want you to know that if you are going to a team clinic, that you will get the best proactive care that, that can be had anywhere on this planet. 
So the goals of management in ALS are these, and they're on your handout, to help you live longer, to give you more energy, to make each day as good as possible, to make your quality of life as good as it can possibly be, to anticipate your needs so we can address those needs, keep on top of things, give guidance and support, and to remember your family, to care for the caregiver. We want to do that as well. We care about you as a patient, but we also care about the patient's family because we want to keep you strong. We know, we know that when caregivers are paid attention to and are supported, that the patient also does better. So I'd like to read to you the philosophy of care from Dr. Forbes Norris and Hiroshi Mitsumoto that was stated in 1994 in a preamble to a book that they wrote together. Now in 1994, most patients with ALS weren't given much care. And what they stated in this philosophy of care was actually quite remarkable and was cutting edge. And they were speaking to their fellow physicians and telling them how they can do better with caring for people with ALS. So here it is. There's a great deal that can be done to treat the symptoms of ALS, to improve the quality of life of a patient, and to help caregivers and the family cope with the disease. This was landmark thinking, treating symptoms, paying attention to quality of life, and paying attention to caregivers and the family.